Hi, welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. It's September 1st, 2021, and there is a lot going on with shipping right now. I had planned to put together several short little episodes on a variety of different topics, and I got to tell you, there's just too much going on. I I need to kind of get caught up to have a good level playing field. So we're going to do a little bit of a news summation. We're going to run through some stories that are out there developed over the week, and the big ones, I think, are looming on the horizon for us. So let's go ahead and get into this. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano, chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science at Campbell University, former merchant mariner, and an adjunct professor in maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. So this is a story that caught my eye first. This is a story out of G Captain, uh, which is out of Bloomberg's story about the impact of Hurricane Ida, which hit Louisiana. Came ashore at Port Fouchon, just southwest of New Orleans. The hurricane came in ashore as a Cat 4, right on the brim of a Cat 5, just inundated the entire area there. Uh, more importantly, it disrupted power support. I mean, most of Louisiana is without power, including the port of New Orleans. It has just caused havoc. And we talked about the impact this was having on the loop, the Louisiana offshore oil platform, but this is going to have an impact on the Mississippi River and the ability for grain elevators to load bulk ships with corn. We see already a 3.2% spike in corn futures for December. And we're seeing this kind of cascade issue of whether or not corn, wheat, soybean, you name it, are going to be be, um, a factor here in exports. Again, it's September, you're harvesting. This is when we're gonna start seeing the exports really start to peak right here. And if you can't get out of the interior of the United States, which New Orleans is the plug in the Mississippi River, then it's going to be a big problem. And you can see that graphically here. I always love using marine traffic to demonstrate issues to my students. And if you look up here, kind of zoom down here a little bit, you can see those blue dots are all up and down the Mississippi River, the Ohio, the Cumberland, the Tennessee, the Missouri, the Illinois, up onto the Great Lakes. This is the breadbasket of the United States, the area between the Rockies and and um, the Appalachian Mountains. It's, it's a big, huge, massive river valley. And all of it, all of it dumps down into New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico. And unfortunately, what Hurricane Ida has done is basically put a halt on that. If we zoom in here around the, uh, let's see if we could zoom in here around New Orleans. Here's New Orleans. Here's the loop over here. We don't see any traffic right now. No tankers, nothing around the loop. But if we come in here around New Orleans, around the Southwest Passage, you can just see a parking lot right now. Parking lot of ships sitting there. There's the Southport Eagle, a bulk carrier out of the Marshall Islands. Uh, she's coming in right now, trying to get in through the Southwest Passage to get up there to be able to start loading. And what we're going to see here is just a, a load of vessels starting to arrive in here and just sitting at the anchorages. You can see some more vessels coming in here. And we're just going to see that big, huge parking lot develop it. We've talked about the parking lot off California. Well, we're seeing one develop right now off New Orleans. Uh, And again, we've seen the damage. This is Port Fouchon. This is a story out of Maritime Executive showing the damage that has been undertaking in Port Fouchon. So Fouchon is absolutely essential for the oil and gas industry. This is where a lot of the offshore boats, you can see some of the Chouest boats sitting up there, very distinctive, the orange and yellow right there. Uh, With the shutdown here of the oil industry, we're seeing major issues right now. Uh, right here, the story is talking about the fact that uh, nine out of 11 operating oil rigs right now have been evacuated. They're talking about the decrease as of Monday, 93% of the offshore oil production, 94% offshore gas production was shut down. And there was a brief shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline. Those are those twin pipelines that go from Houston up to New York, where we've seen the hack earlier this year. They're back up and running, fortunately. They just had a survey of the oil pipeline to make sure. I should mention that some oil companies were, were already sniffing around for a Jones Act waiver to try to get around that. But again, the pipeline wasn't disrupted. What we're seeing here is a disruption, not in transportation, but in production, which is the big issue, and also the export, which is going to hurt a lot of people. Uh, the amount of damage in Port Fouchon is extensive. It's going to take a lot. Uh, you're talking about not just rebuilding piers and, and, and warehouses, but you're talking about dredging. You're talking about getting depths back into the waters. This is going to take a, a large level of efforts, not to mention which you got people out without power. 
food and water is going to start running out here soon. And it's going to be a real big issue. Yes, power companies are coming in there. They've been prepositioned in the area. But to get into the interior here, the problem with, her, with a hurricane the size of Ida, it just rips apart everything along the fringes. And even to get at where the hurricane came ashore, it's very difficult. The best thing to do, actually, is fall in behind it from the sea and do that. But a lot of resources right now are being used in other areas. Uh, this is a little video they had here of the damage in and around Port Fushan. And you can see it. I mean, there's piers there. These vessels are actually tied up to piers, uh, but you can't really see the piers there because they're underwater at the time. That's the level of damage that we're talking about here. It's, it's absolutely just crazy how much water got inundated in this area. Uh, Coast Guard is on scene, but the Coast Guard is stretched thin to begin with. This Coast Guard stretched thin on a normal day. Can I be clear? They don't get anywhere near the money they need. Uh, they are the most underfunded agency, federal agency, I think, in the world, or in the United States, I should say. But they're already in the midst of a huge humanitarian operation in Haiti right now. And now they're trying to get in there and assess images. They got to get back in. They got to survey channels. They got to make sure you can bring deep draft vessels up into New Orleans. Because of the hurricane, you may have shifted some banks. You don't want things going aground. Uh, and, and they're in the midst of a massive search and rescue operation that is just absolutely huge. So you're talking about you know millions of people right now who, who need help. And that's a big chore for any agency, let alone the US Coast Guard. On other news, we're seeing issues with the backlog in containers again, where we still got this shortfall going on, record number of vessels off the port of LA Long Beach. Uh, uh, as of today, it was 44 vessels waiting to offload. And the Biden administration has announced the appointment of a port envoy to address supply train disruption. So the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation announced that John Porcari will be the port envoy to the Biden-Harris administration supply train distributions task force. Fantastic. Great job. That's what we need. We need a port czar in there. You know who else we need? A maritime administrator. No maritime administrator, no administrator to oversee the maritime sector of the United States. Great to have a port czar, fantastic. But what would really be good right now is a maritime administrator to get out there. Don't have one. We finally got a secretary of the Navy. That took forever. But now we're waiting for a maritime administrator to come in. And, and again, back in the day, prior to 1961, when the Maritime Administration and the Federal Maritime Commission were together, you had a deputy secretary who oversaw all this. Uh, now having a port envoy, port czar, whatever you want to call this guy is great. But now we have to deal with issues. And the other question is, the FMC is looking into this. The Federal Maritime Commission is looking in this. And they talk about this, about meeting with people. They met with the World Shipping Council. Again, the most evil sounding organization ever, but they still want to keep calling themselves that. Uh, the Agricultural Transportation Coalition, it's a nice sounding agency, it doesn't sound evil at all. And leading companies, they're meeting to try to do with this. But again, there's a lot of backdrop here. And let me give you some of the backdrop here that's going on. So here's a story from Greg Miller. Greg over at American Shipper always does you know, great reporting here. Uh, we're talking about shattering records. Uh, number of container ships at Los Angeles Long Beach now 4.8 times pre-COVID levels. Just banging the number of ships that are off there. And if you look at the levels here, here's a chart that goes, and I apologize, my, my bad eyes, I apologize. Back to early 2019, you can see the numbers at anchor in red, the numbers at birth, and then this crazy, crazy jump that starts in October of 2020 recedes just a little bit. We got a little bit caught up there. Then all of a sudden, Yanatan and, and, and Ningbao happen. And now we're, we're still trying to catch up. Oh, no, so I had ever given in the Suez. You had all that issues going on. And now we're just still trying to catch up. And again, the, the, the ports here, this is an image, again, off the port of Long Beach. Let's go to marine traffic here and head over across to LA Long Beach here. Zoom in here and take a look at what's going on off the port. And it's just, again, oh my God, it's, it's just, it, it's the amount of parking off here is just insane. Can I be clear? Uh, very, very few times am I taken aback. By, by looking at images, but, but this is a really good one right here. Uh, you just, you kind of see it right there of, of what's going on here. 
So this is just an image here. Let's go into the port here a little bit here. It's the LA side right there. So you can see vessels just, you know, banged up against the anchorage right here, one after the other, after another, all in the area here. They're also up here in the upper area here, working the, the terminals here, just getting moved. And then over on the Long Beach side, you can see them right here, Matson up here. We'll have theirs. Over here will be some Maersk vessels, Hyundai, HMM, MSC, other ones around here. Just a just a, a jam-packed area right here. It's crazy, crazy at this anchorage is this busy. And again, it, it's not isolated to just LA Long Beach. Again, if you go up the coast here, let's go in here to Alameda. You see the anchorage inside San Francisco Bay right there. Same thing, I can take you around the world. I'll take you to Felix Stowe. I can take you to, to European ports. Maybe not as pronounced, but just as significant. Just as significant. Uh, and what we're seeing right now is no relief for shippers as congestions and rates continue to build. Go to Container News and everyone's got surcharge additions. Rates are going up. We're seeing the escalation here across the board. Again, it, it's just the amount of volume of cargo and the, the fact that we can't move boxes fast enough. Port of LA can put on a third shift. They can do that tomorrow. Port of Long Beach can put on a third shift. It doesn't do any good. They can't get the boxes off the terminal. We need rail. We need road capacity. We need infrastructure. So it drives me crazy when we're debating infrastructure and everybody's debating these little you know, sides of infrastructure. We really need to invest in infrastructure because what infrastructure does, it pays for itself in the long run. If you invest smartly, that's always the key thing. Don't build the bridge to nowhere, but invest in infrastructure that we need. Really important. So in the midst of all this, we've seen shippers, those who want to ship goods, file lawsuits against companies that are not shipping their goods. And I made a case for one not too long ago where we talked about a furniture company out of Pennsylvania who made this case, MCS Industries. They filed a uh, case with the Federal Maritime Commission against two companies, Costco, the Chinese Overseas Shipping Company, and MSC, the Mediterranean Shipping Company. Well, both these companies came out, in the words of Greg Miller, swinging in high-profile uh, uh, ways. They are alleging that MSCS is completely wrong, that their allegations that their companies are profiteering off this are completely inaccurate. And in this story, which I will link to, you can see what they're doing. And, and here's Mediterranean Shipping Company. They issued a press release. Let's look at that press release here because it, it, it's an interesting press release. I meant to pull it up here. They basically are rejecting it. Uh, MSC said it was shocked, shocked to learn of the accusations made by the Eastern Pennsylvania-based MCS Industries. Shocked to find out there was gambling going on here. Uh, again, they may be shocked, but they shouldn't be. Because there's no doubt, because again, I can put alongside these stories, you know, stories of basically uh, uh, massive uh, profits. Here's Costco's H1 profit, 21 times, 21 times larger than their year on profit. So Costco in 2021, first half profit rocked 21 fold, $6.53 billion, billions. They generated a profit of 7.21, more than doubling, doubling from 356.82 million in H1. I mean, it's a crazy amount of money that they're prospering from. And granted, F FMC needs to make their case. They need to make their case. The problem is they are a small company compared to the likes of Costco and MSC, which are coming out and basically alleging not just that they're wrong, but they're actually arguing uh, for basically liability. They are arguing that this company is lying about them. And, and this case is going to be a long time. I mean, it's not going to, this is not going to come out in this case until 2023. But again, one of the things that if you remember, we talked about a long time ago, but Rebecca Dye, who's one of the commissioners on FMC, had sat there and said, we're going to make cases for clients because they're worried about repercussions should companies file against these companies. And here you go, repercussions against them 
filing against them. Again, if you read this story by Greg Millett, I, I strongly recommend it, you know, stating that it was reviewing whether any of the allegations amount to defamation, defamation. So basically, should we sue this company our you know, the shipping company here for for basically saying the bad things about Mediterranean shipping company? Again, that's the Swiss. You've got the Swiss mad. If you can get the Swiss mad at you, this gives you an idea of the amount of tension right now here. And if they can make an example of MCS, I mean, that's going to be intimidating. It's really an intimidating thing. And I think there needs to be investigation in this. Maybe, you know, our new uh, 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 port czar here can get in here and take a look at this and see whether or not MSC and Costco, you know, the, the, the Swiss and the Chinese are trying to shake down American firms. Don't know. In another piece of news, which again, to put this into context, the amount of, of shipping stuff going on is just crazy. We had a ship go through the Suez Canal the other day, which didn't get a lot of attention, but it really should have. The largest container ship in the world, the Ever Ace, went through the Suez Canal. There she is. The Ever Ace, uh, bigger than Ever Given, uh, went through with an entire load, by the way, of evergreen containers on board. So she was decked out in green. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, she went through uh, the canal uh, in, in a big ceremony to go through. Ever Ace comes in. She's actually right around the kind of kind of the same size, right around the length of Ever Given, but she can carry 24,000 boxes. Ever Given was at 20,000 boxes. So this, this the, the, the A-class coming out right now by Evergreen are mammoth, absolutely huge vessels coming out. And these vessels, we're seeing the growth of these vessels. It's interesting to look at ship ordering. I was going to do a video on Maersk. Maersk just placed some ship orders and I will do that because Maersk is very interesting because of the fuel they're selecting. But but these vessels here are just monsters, monsters. And I guarantee you, she got a lot of attention going through the Suez Canal, uh, probably just to make sure she didn't touch anything. Uh, another crazy story, because there's such a shortage in container ships, some bulk carriers are talking about using their vessels, these large Cape vessels, Cape size vessels. These are vessels designed to go around the Cape of Good Hope and fitting containers into them for parts of the voyages. Uh, Starbulk's talking about a shipment of 1,400 containers. You can't just stick containers in a ship. You have to have lashings so they don't move around. You have to secure them. You also have to insure them too. I'm not sure who's going to insure carrying containers on a non-container vessel. So, not exactly sure if this is going to work or what's going to happen with this. It's an interesting story. Uh, there was a day back in the uh, 70s and 80s when these vessels, these ore bulk carriers were also configured to carry oil. They were known as OBOs, o OBOs. But uh, I don't think anyone ever uh, envisioned an o OPEC, uh, an ore bulk container carrier. But that's basically what we're getting right here. So we're seeing that fit out. Again, it's just because of the craziness. There's no vessels to charter. That Basically, everything is chartered that can carry a container. So they're going to try using these cape size vessels. Another interesting story, this is out of Lodestar. China-Europe rail delays as borders close, capacity gets super tight. So one of the things that China has been developing under the Belt and Road Initiative is this massive rail program across Central Asia. And they are using it. They, they are pushing rail across Central Asia. But even that's getting at capacity. One of the things they're trying to use this new Silk Road intermodal system to do is get some of the high value cargo, especially during what they call Golden Week, where, where they're trying to get everything shipped so it makes it to the U.S. in time for Black Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, the last Thursday in, in November. Make sure they uh, get it in place there to uh, get it on sale. So they were shipping some stuff via these railroads to get to Europe so that the European carriers or the European vessels can sail it across the Atlantic. But now, even that is at capacity right now. And it's a very finite capacity. It's not surprising this has happened, but they're pushing that system quite a bit. And then finally, one last story, just because I think it's really an important one to say, we've got a lot of issues going on in, in, in shipping right now. But all of a sudden, this announcement from HMM, the eighth largest container carrier of the world, came out here. And we have an issue with a potential strike. Uh, 
this has been going on. It's been behind the scenes for a little bit now, but the uh, seafarers for HMM, 600 of the seafarers, these are Korean seafarers, largely officers on their Korean flag vessels and some of the other vessels uh, are in the midst of a negotiation for more money. And understand, one of the things that companies have been doing is, is bleeding off expensive crews. This is why you don't see a lot of American ships out there, because American mariners are expensive. They, they fought hard for these rights, and they got them. Uh, they had to compete against British, who British would pay fairly low salaries unless you were on the premier vessels. And then they would supplement their crews with Africans, Caribbeans, Indians uh, from the empire because they were considered British. Americans, you know, fought in the early 20th century to get these high rates. Well, post-World War II, flags of convenience, Panama, Liberia, later on Marshall Islands, Isle of Man, Malta, you name it, the Greeks, the Norwegians, the, the Danes set up their international registries. And they get crews from basically developing nations, which they can pay very little. But HMM, which used to be Hyundai Merchant Marine, basically took in a lot of the Korean mariners who used to work on Hanjin and now HMM, and now they are threatening to walk off. And not only are they threatening to walk off, but they supposedly have an agreement with MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company, to go over there and work for them. And now the HMM office staff is basically saying they're going to go on strike with the seafarers. And that means that office staff in the HMM office may come to a screeching halt if that happens. Uh, the, the MSC is talking about offering 2.5 what HMM is offering. I, I, I'm very leery about this offer from, H, uh, from MSC, by the way, because I, I want to know what they're doing here. Because you, know, you don't just double and a half someone's salary to bring them over. I think they're trying to hurt HMM. Uh, they're trying to, this is a, a way to get at HMM, which really is not uh, uh, you know, a, a freight way. You can't really, you can't get at anybody right now. The big companies cannot get at each other right now. Sorry, peanuts squeaking her toy. Uh, there she is again. Uh, HMM is trying, you know, you, you can't compete against carriers right now by underbidding them. That, that, that doesn't work because there's just no capacity. So everybody's making money. So what's the best way to run a container ship line out of business or, or hurt them? This may be the best way by incurring problems with their crewing. So I pull this up. MSC right now is number two in the world, 16.7% uh, of the share, but they're on the precipice of eclipsing Maersk. You can see the ships they got building. They will become number one. HMM is sitting down here as number eight. They're in different alliances. Uh, MSC and Maersk are in the 2M alliance. Uh, HMM is in the alliance, I believe. And so... You know, you can't get at each other by underbidding each other, but if you can incapacitate their fleet by strikes, by causing disruptions, then that's something you try to do. And I think that's part of a plan here by MSC to, to kind of do that, kind of facilitate this and try to get them. Again, you look at this right here, what they're talking about here in the wages. Uh, company Seafarers office staff uh, want salaries raised by 25% and reportedly unhappy about a pay raise of just 2% in 2020. Now, this is a period when Mariner's wages were frozen in HMM from 2011 to 2019 because of poor performance. If you look at the container service, I would never be running those videos back then because it was just, it was cruddy, sir. It was cruddy. It was just a lousy period. They weren't making money. But now HMM not only has cash flowing in, in the billions, but they're spending it on vessel replacement. They're investing in, in new construction. And basically, the seafarers, they're rejecting an offer of an 8% raise, a bonus amounting to 300% of their wages, and a 200% productivity incentive in 2022. They want the back pay that was basically promised to them. And if they don't get that back pay, uh, they're going to walk. And that has a huge repercussions for Korea. Understand HMM is the last major seafaring line out of Korea, or less big one, I should say. There's other ones they talk about here, KMTC, the Korean Line Corporation, SK Shipping, and the H Line. But HMM is the big one out there. And so they, they've got issues. The union goes on here to say seafarers are supposed to work a minimum of 313 hours a month, including overtime, but some employees work over 320 hours and did not receive extra pay or rest. 
So it it can lose massive amounts of money, HMM, if they don't get this negotiation ironed out because they cannot afford to let their ships lay up and nobody wants these ships laid up. Now, I should say if you're MSC, it may not be a bad deal because that will free slots up in ports if HMM ships aren't running in. If you're competing against them on routes, you're in a good position then. And when this all settles, you may be able to get some of those routes over to you and HMM may go away. And now you're down from nine big companies in three alliances down to eight companies in three alliances. And again, Maersk and MSC, the 2M alliance is the biggest of the, of the three. All right, lots of process there, but hopefully we get you up to speed for shipping as we roll here in the September. So that was your September recap. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Hopefully we, we will have a maybe a little quiet in the shipping industry, but I don't think so. I think it's just going to get crazier and nuttier as it goes on. And as it does, I'll be here. So if you enjoyed this, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Give it a thumbs up, share it across social media, leave a comment, do what you need to do to get what's going on with shipping out there into the mainstream. Until next time, this is Sal signing off.